And today we're kicking it off with God-centered relationships. All right? But my question I had was, oh, one guy was excited. Amen, amen. Swipe up, swipe up. <laughs> one, <laughs> one thing I was thinking, though, was, God, why relationships? Because if I think about the stress in my life, it comes from relationships. Like, you know, why couldn't you have made us like sea turtles? Do you know about sea turtles? Like, the, the female sea turtle that's impregnated crawls up onto shore, digs a hole, lays the eggs very lovingly, covers the hole, and waddles back into the sea to never see those sea turtles again. Those li little sea turtles on their own hatch, and they just know, get to the sea. And they just make their way into the water, and they just live their lives. Some of them live to 50 years old. Some documented even 150. Seems like they're doing okay, right? God, why did you just make us like sea turtles? Like, why, why this complicated relational thing that now I've got to pay a therapist to help me unpack all the stuff that happened, you know, my mom and dad and uncle and cousin and all the stuff. Like, like why, why relationships, God? So much of my stress seems to come from relationships. My wife is sitting in the front row. Hi. <laughs> you know, but there's this drive in us to connect, right? Who cares what the statistics say about divorce? Like, there's this drive to connect. You know, they even say that um, in your workplace, if you have a best friend at work, and I was like, people have friends at work. That's where I'm coming from. You got a friend, and let alone a best friend. They say, if you have a best friend at work, your performance goes up. You outperform those who don't have any friends at work. If you're one of those, I ain't got no friends. At, well, you know, you're performing. <laughs> it's like, they say if you have it, and this is how you know they're your best friend. It's not because they got you a Starbucks when they went to get Starbucks. It's say when you can ask them the dumb question without being afraid of being judged, that's a best friend at work. And they say when you have a best friend at work, not only do you ask them all the stupid questions, you're not you're afraid to ask everyone else, you will actually be willing to stay behind and do extra work for them if they need it. It's not just about what you get. It's what you give, right? I've talked to some athletes who've played at the highest levels. And what they say is when they're done with their career, it's not like the adoration of the fans that they miss. And some people, you know, they miss it. But they say, it's that camaraderie I had in the locker room that I really miss and I'm trying to replace. They found this out in the military. Very few people will die for a flag. But almost everyone will lay their life down for the person on their left and right in the foxhole. Like we're built, we're wired for human connection, for relationships. Even if we've experienced pain, we can't help but just like the sea turtle just keeps trying to make its way to the sea. We just keep reaching for connection and relationships. God who created relationships. You know, someone once told me I, God created man because uh, he was lonely, right? And, and that, and I was like, 14, 15 year olds when I, when I heard that. And that, that just made me kind of like, dang, God sounds needy, <laughs> right? Like he, he created me because he needed people to worship him. Sing, sing, let's create 9 billion people. Sing to me. I was like, dang, God sounds needy. But I, I don't think God was lonely. Because if you actually read the scriptures, it says that God created and God spoke, but he said, let us make man in our image. Let us make women in our image. He said us because there exists what we call in the Christian faith, the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in this trinity, there is a community. And you see it throughout the scriptures that there's always God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. There's not a loneliness. There is this joy of being together in this perfect relationship. And out of that, God was like, I want to just keep this good thing going. Let's create. So I want to know what God has to say about relationships. In John 15, he says, the vine and the branches. I'm the true vine and my father's the gardener. If there's a true vine, there must be false vines. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Some of y'all think God is punishing you because it hurts and things are getting cut out of your life, but he's pruning you. Like my wife's a gardener. And so we have this lemon tree. And she tells me all these fascinating things. And, and did you know that when you prune a tree correctly, it will actually bear more fruit? Like, like for me, I feel like if you, if you cut a branch, you're killing the tree, right? But what happens is when you cut off those parts that are sickly and dying, it, all the resources and nutrients of the tree go to everything. 
even the things that are not going to bear fruit. So a gardener that's skilled knows which branches are not going to bear fruit, cut that off, and all the life-giving nutrients flow to the branches that will bear fruit. God is pruning you. He says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains, there's that word again, in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. I had a pause on that. I'm like, really? Because I feel like I, I'm pretty competent. I can't do some things. Nothing without you? If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. That was another place I had to pause. Wait, if I remain in you and you remain in me, I can ask for whatever I want and it will be done? Who's experiencing that in their life? Okay, let's talk. We're going to talk after service. I have some things I want you to ask for me. And then it's going to be done. Amen. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Now, Jesus says this, but if you go to John 14, it's the same thing over and over. Remain in me and I'll remain in you. My father has loved me and I will love you. New command I give you, love one another. You go to John 13, he's saying the same thing. Remain in me, don't don't depart from me. The Father's love me and I will love you. A new command I give to you, love one another. He's saying the same thing over and over and over because he knows that just in a few hours, the soldiers will come and take him from Gethsemane to be tried. And in a few days, he'll be hanging on a cross. So it's like the last words he's gonna say to his people, to his followers and disciples. And he's like, don't lose this. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Don't be disconnected from me. That word remain actually means abide. And that word abide sounds like abode, which means home. So what Jesus is saying is make your home in me and I will make my home in you. You know, right now my children are gone. They're not at home. <laughs> like they, they gone, right? Because our school, we work at a school, it, 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 end, it ended up, we go, we go a week longer than OUSD. You know, we're, I say, we, we're doing too much. We go a week longer. Um, so my, my kids, they usually come to work with us for a whole week. It's really hard for them. It's hard for us. Um, but this week, this year, we, my wife had the brilliant idea. Hey, we've got some Southwest points. Let's fly them to my mom and dad's. And I was like, let's go. We put them on a plane. They gone. <laughs> wow. All the parents are clapping. And the young people are judging us like, wow, what kind of parents are you? You don't know. <laughs> so they gone. Now, um, here's what surprised me. Well, there are some great things. Um, like my wife and I, we went to brunch yesterday. Brunch. And usually when we go to brunch, um, we, I've got to like start getting everybody ready like 30 minutes ahead of time, right? And then put on your shoes, put on your shoes. Why are you don't have your shoes on? Like what happened? Why are you less stressed now than when I told you you took clothes off? What's going on? Right? And but like five minutes before the place opens, we hop in the car, we pull over, and we're just standing in line. Right? And normally we order one pastry and we split it four ways. I ordered two pastries. <laughs> and we're just taking it. And normally, like, we're eating the pastries, and I'm looking at my kids, and I'm like, arr, 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 because if I want to enjoy it, they eat it all, right? So I'm like, we're just hungry hippoing this thing, right? Like, arr, arr, arr. like we're taking our time. Even I, we, we, had, we got the pastries first, but there were still pastries after the meal, right? I can enjoy some. It was, it was great, right? And I'm just, it's like, wow, we can't do these things when our kids are always around. And, um, but, but I have to admit, um, I did miss them. I did. And I think it surprised me how much I miss them. And there was one time I, I was on a call, and so, so my wife FaceTimed our, our daughters. And then um, after my call, I ran out, hey, let's FaceTime them. And she's like, oh, I already did it. I was like, what? How dare you? And she's like, yeah, they're going to sleep now. They're probably in bed. They're probably asleep. They, they're not going to see you. And I was like, Oh, 
I went to bed a little sad. You know, woke up. I made a little video for them. Like, hey, when you guys wake up, you know, I didn't get a chance. You know, and I, <laughs> someone's laughing at me over there. But, but, but like, I just realized, like, I, I don't want to visit my kids. I want them to live with me. And I know God's the same way. He's like, I, I, I don't want my kids to visit. I want you to make your home in me. And I'm going to make my home in you. I tell my daughters, you know, some people are foolish. And when they turn 18, they pay exorbitant rent. You could be wise and live at home. <laughs> it's like, and my wife is always like, no, let, you know, let them spread their wings and fly. And I'm like, oh, okay. But there's this desire of like, we will always be your home. You can always come home. God said, make your home in me and I will make my home in you. John Mark Comer, author of Practicing the Way, said, the question isn't, are you abiding? It's, what are you abiding in? All of us have a source we're rooted in. It's an emotional home. It's where our minds go when they're not busy with tasks, where our feelings go when we need solace, where our bodies go when we have free time, and where our money goes after we pay the bills. We will make a home somewhere. The question is, where? Where do you turn? Who do you turn to? Man, I know for me, going to church for decades, being given opportunities to speak in front of people, God's word. And so many times when I need solace or I'm tired, I turn to Netflix. There were times, even in my 20s, I actually remember sitting in a movie theater, like three people in the theater and the lights are dimming. And I remember saying, take me away. Like, I just need to escape what's happening in my life right now. There's so much stress and I, it's just, ah, help me to forget and just take me away. So whether it's Netflix, movies, my wife knows too. Like, if she's like, she, if she opens up the freezer and there's frozen pizzas and ice cream, she's like, how are you doing, Joe? Like, she knows. She, she, she's even told me, I worry about you when you start buying frozen pizzas. Like, there's something going on that you're not dealing with. Like, who do you turn to? Where do you turn to? I remember one time I was watching a Cal football team, uh, a game back when I used to watch Cal football, you know, still love you. Right. But, um, I don't really watch it anymore. And I was sitting there because, you know, I was like, I'm tired. I've done a lot. You know, I just want to relax, enjoy the game. And then of course, what happens right then? God happens. Spend time with me, Joe. I'm like, no, I just sat down to watch this game. Can't you wait three hours and then I'll spend some time with you? Ah, I felt God saying, spend time with me, Joe. And I was like, so resistant. I was like, I'm too tired. God, I'm too tired to spend time with you right now. And I felt God saying to me, you believe a lie about me. And I was like, what do you mean? I believe a lie about you. And it just hit me. And I could feel God saying to me, you think I just want to take from you. You think I'm demanding. I will suck up all your energy. I want your money, your time, your service, your happiness. Give it to me. I'm going to take everything from you. And when you're a shriveled little shell, I'll be like, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> you think I just want to take everything from you. So when you're tired, you don't come to me. You go to football. You go to frozen pizza. You go to so many other things, but you won't come to me. Who do you turn to when you need rest? Where do you go? That's your vine. That's where you're abiding and making your home. Whether it's frozen pizza and ice cream, Netflix, or Amazon, I had an Amazon problem and my wife did because of me and she would get so, she told me, I'm so embarrassed because every day this Amazon truck shows up in front of our house and all the neighbors know it's coming to our house and they drop off a box or a little envelope 
And I want to tell people, it's not me, it's him. <laughs> and I was even reflecting, like, why do I keep buying these things on Amazon? Some things, yeah, maybe I need. But for me, it's like, it gives me like this sense of false hope of something good's coming. Like, oh, something's coming. Something good is coming. And instead of going to God, I just, it's just easier to swipe, swipe. There you go. Where are you making your emotional home? It was so hard for me to abide with God because, I mean, my false view of God is that he's demanding and hard to please. It makes sense. Who wants to live with someone like that? It's never enough. I'm never enough. I don't want to spend time with someone who thinks, makes me feel that way. A.W. Tozer, uh, pastor in the 20th century. That means he's been dead for over 100 years. People consider him a prophet. Said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God? You know, an interesting thing is um, even neuroscience, which is just a study of our brain and how our brain circuitry is wired, is starting to show us this same thing. There's Andrew Newberg, neuroscientist, not a Christian. He said, if you contemplate God long enough, something surprising happens in the brain. Neural functioning begins to change. Your brain actually begins to rewire itself. Different circuits become activated while others become deactivated. You don't see this anywhere else in the animal kingdom. And he said, if you believe there is a God, it changes your brain. If you say there is no God, guess what? That also rewires your brain. And what you believe about God rewires your brain. If you believe God is loving and kind and patient, it activates the centers in your brain that increase compassion and empathy. If you believe God is demanding, harsh, judgmental, and angry, it actually increases the centers in your brain that make you more judgmental and fearful. What you think about God changes who you are. Even if you think there is no God, that still changes your brain and influences your behavior. What you think about God is the most important thing. And I'm in this place of tension because I grew up, if you want to say grew up in church, heard so many messages, over 40 years being a part of the Christian faith and realizing I'm not becoming a more loving person. Like I'm becoming more easily offended. Like I'm not as patient with my kids. I'm not patient with my kids. I mean, you know, there was a time where people were like, Joe, why aren't you dating? Why aren't you dating? And why aren't you getting married? Why aren't you dating? You know, you're good looking in your own way. <laughs> it was like, you know, you're, you know, yeah, you know, why aren't you dating? Why? Oh, right now I'm getting flat PTSD, right? Like, and I never said this to anyone. I say, oh, you know, there's just not the right person. It's not the right time. I'm busy on this thing, trying to build this thing, you know. Um, but the real reason was I didn't trust myself. I actually had a moment where I thought to myself, I don't know if I can trust myself around a family. Like, what if that one time I can't control my anger and my temper and I lose it, and I just lash out. Like, I couldn't live with myself. And so when I was young, I made a promise. I was like, I want to get married. I want a family. But I just don't know if I can say that I would never hurt them. So I, it's better that I never get married, because I never want to do that to anybody. Never want to hurt someone in that way. So it's better if I just never get married. But I still did. <laughs> I got married. And just realizing like, God, I want to be patient and gentle and loving. And I'm better than I was. But I've just hit a wall where there's this parts of me that I can't change, God. 
And the longer I go to church, I'm just frustrated because I, I'm not changing. And they're letting me speak more, but I'm not changing. And I know more, but I'm not changing. And then there are parts of me I'm scared to admit because I've spoken on the stage now. I don't know what to do with this, God. And there was a time I was sitting, and this was a while ago, and I was just wrestling and just, God, I, I do the things I know I shouldn't do. And then in church, they got me leading these things and no one knows. And God, I'm just, I feel like such a hypocrite and like feeling like a hypocrite. I just want to run away and hide and not even go to church anymore. And, and God, you must be so disappointed in me. And I, I, I just want to quit this thing. Like, ah, and I, and I, I'm, I, I, maybe it's even, I even feel like I hate myself. Like, why do I keep doing these things? Why, why? And I was like, God, I, how could you even love me? I thought, God, how could you even love me? And then God sent Gwen St Stefani. I mean, she was just playing on TV, but like, but it was, but it was God. And she started singing these words to me. I'm not going to sing it, but she started singing, you really love me underneath it all. I don't even know the rest of that song. But she just kept singing that like, like, you really love me underneath it all. And I just started, I just started like, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a girl, I'm, t I'm tall, right? Like, you know, I, I cried. I was like, God, how could you love me? You really love me underneath it all. You really love me. And I just started to say that back to God. I was like, you really love? And it was first of a question, like, you really love me? Underneath it all? You really? And then it just became like, you really love me? Underneath it all, you really love me? When's the last time someone looked at you with a loving gaze? This is the question I asked my wife yesterday. And she said, hmm, let me think about that. And we're lying in bed. Yeah, still no answer. And then she rolls over to me. I'm like, okay. And she says, I can't remember the last time someone looked at me lovingly. And I was like, what? <laughs> she's like, I don't look at you lovingly? And she's like, well, you know. <laughs> and I was like, well, well, I don't think you recognize my loving look. Because when, 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 because I look at you lovingly all the time. Right? When, and when you look at me lovingly, it's easy. Right? Anyone could tell because you do this. So it's easy, right? Like, but if you really knew me, you would know because my loving gaze is like this. <laughs> and I showed her and she's like, oh, I know this face. I was like, that's my loving gaze. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's like, do you want me to do this? And she's like, well, that really lets me know that you're, I was like, okay, I, I will try. I'll try to do that. But it says in 2 Corinthians, and we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Basically what it says is this, there's a veil on your face and you can still see, but it kind of distorts. But once that veil is removed, you can see God's face. Contemplate means to behold to gaze upon. And as you gaze upon the beauty and the glory of God, what happens? You're transformed into what? His glory. Other people have said, you become what you behold. When you see that God is gazing at you in love and you gaze back, it is within that beholding that you become. That's what transforms you. And I think... I need to read a book. 
that's not bad. I do read books. I need therapy. I've gone to therapy. Again, not bad. But the thing that actually brings the deepest transformation is being in that place where you're experiencing being loved by God. And loved by God, when you feel unlovable, that's the key. When you're proud of yourself and you're like, I fasted this week, I didn't sin. You know, I swear, I don't know if it's left or right, whatever it is. Like, I did the right things. So, God, I know you love me. I'm lifting my hands right now. That's one thing. But when you're in that place where, like, oh, even I can't look at myself, that's the place where you need to see God looking at you with love. That's what will transform you. The biggest fear people have is, I can't really show who I really am. How many of you go to work and you're like, well, this is the work me. This ain't the real me. And people, laugh, they resonate like, oh, if they knew, if you all knew how I really was, right? I mean, I've had people say that to me about work too. I'm at work, I'm one way. And then outside of the work, they're like, who are you? <laughs> to really be who we are and letting God even love us in the sin. When's the last time someone looked at you with a loving gaze? Right now. But my gaze will not change you. <laughs> Has no power to transform you. But God's gaze gets into the deepest places, the deepest cracks, the parts we keep hidden, even the parts that we want to avoid and not look at ourselves. The gaze of God transforms those areas. Modern science is now verifying ancient scripture. You become what you behold. And then it becomes no longer about doing the right thing. You just start to delight in the right thing. How many of us did the right thing? We're like, that's the right thing. And I really don't want to do it. But man, as you just stay in that loving gaze with God, it transformed you. Like, I know I have more to grow. But the kind of father I am now, like the patience I have now compared to when I, my kids were first born, so much more patient. Like, I mean, I'm less offendable now, Right? Okay, I, I am. Like, when we first got married, the insecurity was so big. I didn't know I was insecure. I didn't know I was insecure. I thought I was a confident young man. I had no idea the insecurity that I was just waiting for my wife. Wow, right? And as it came out in marriage, like, the person that God has transformed me into now, I'm like, yes, God, transform me deeper and deeper you know, one of my favorite books um, used to be The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Like, Shel Silverstein. Like, and I, where the sidewalk ends. Like, as a kid, I loved reading his poems. And, and that book, um, I, when, I, when I spoke for a children's group one time, I even brought that book and, and read them that story and said, look at this sacrifice and generosity. And then when we had kids, and I think Olivia might have been three or four, um, I bought the book. Like, oh, I love this book. I want to read it to Olivia. And this time around, as I'm reading it, I'm more and more horrified. There was a boy, and he loved the tree. He wrote his name on the tree. And then he ate all her apples. Then he cut off all her branches. And then he cut off her trunk. And then when he came back in his old man, he says, let me sit on you. And he sits on her. And I was like, now, if you haven't read the story, you're like, this is a horrible story. If you actually read it, you might actually think it was beautiful. I used to think it was beautiful, but I was like, this is a story of a of a relationship where someone just takes and takes and takes and takes and takes. This is not the kind of relationship I want for my children. What do you contemplate? As you are in this loving gaze with God, it's no longer about what you're going to get. It's no longer, God, give me. Even that verse, it says, if you remain in me and I in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done. It isn't even about getting what you want anymore when you're in that relationship with God. And it's, you're not even paralyzed because everything that you want is good. Everything that you want is what he wants. In fact, there are some things that you're too afraid to ask for that as you're in that loving gaze with God, you start to boldly ask for those things. There are things that you don't even know you want or you're, you know, it's not even inside your imagination to dream, to ask God for. Like you think, God, this is what I want. 
I want a $1.5 million house in Oakland, which means it's two bedroom, one bath, right? <laughs> That's what I want, God. I want a job enough to pay my bills and go on vacation. That's what I want, God. I want a husband. I want a wife. You know, like, like that's what I want, God. And great. And God can do all those things. But you don't understand the things yet that you want that are even greater than those things. I mean, my wife and I talk sometimes, and I'm like, I don't know if this is possible, but God, make me the type of the person where it is possible. Because I'm like, before it was like, God, give me a house. Give me a house. Give me. It's like, but now, like, and we're talking, and my wife more than I. Like, I'm following her lead on this. She's like, you know what I really want? Because I was like, you know, if you want to grow generational wealth, you've got to have multiple properties. Brr. Right? <laughs> if you know what that is, you know. Right? And, and, and my wife's like, Ew. And I'm not saying that's wrong. If you got multiple, multiple properties, God bless you. I want to learn from you. But she's like, you know, so many of the people that we know in Oakland are students. Their families have to move away because the housing costs are too much. But what if we could provide a way for them to stay? Like, what if we were so rich, we were the bank? And what's the obstacle for buying a house? And I was going to say down payment, but I was like, down payment and the rest of it, like all of it, right? Like, like, but down payment, right? The down payment, like 20% or whatever it is. And she's like, what if we just gave interest-free down payments for people? Or what if we just gifted the down payment and then we gave them like a 1% loan? So, cause there's still some, you know, something about like paying and, and buying and, and having your own thing that you're investing in. But it's like, but what if you gave a 1% loan, Right? And just made it affordable for people. What if we did that? And I was like, I never thought to ask for that. You must have been in the place where someone was gazing at you lovingly <laughs> to get that kind of ask. Like, the more you spend time with God, the more creative you become. Some of you are called to be artists. The source of creativity, you connect to that source, the true vine, creativity starts to flow. Business ideas start to flow. Courage starts to flow. You become what you behold. But what are you beholding? And for so many times, for me, what I was beholding, as soon as I woke up, was my iPhone. And I would look at it, and it would tell me what was happening. The news, Bitcoin, the Warriors, Okay, I usually go Warriors, then Bitcoin, and then sometimes the news. <laughs> and what it did was, it made me a more anxious person, a more fearful person, someone that felt scarcity. I can't be as generous because, hey, what's happening in the world? Everything's unstable. I don't know. The last thing I would do at night, I would behold my iPhone, Instagram. Hey, let's look at what all my friends are doing. Cool. What's this button here? Oh, I don't know any of these people, but what are they doing? And then all throughout the day as well. And I realized that this is not making me the person that I want to become. And so I started doing a thing where I was like, okay, sunlight before screen light. My phone, I don't, I, I know where it is. I would wake up and be like, phone. I just, my arm just, it's like, I just know exactly where. So my phone, I move far away. It's going to, I think it might have to even leave the bedroom, put on the dresser far away. I lie down and I just come before God and I just direct my thoughts to God and say, God, I'm awake. I'm here. I'm just going to be with you right now. I'm just going to be with you. And that's so hard for me because I'm like, I want to start praying. I want to start asking for things. I want to start praying for other people. Bless my family. Watch over my kids. God, we need this. I start thinking about all the things I need to do and all the worries that I have. It's so hard for me to just sit there and be with God. But I lay there and say, God, gaze at me. Transform me. And I step outside and I just look at the sky and say, God, I just want to be your creation. Like, I, I, there's no prayer right now. I'm just going to be with you right now, God. I want you to make your home in me and I want to be at home in you. And in this gaze, God, something's happening in my brain, in my spirit, in my soul. And I'm becoming transformed. I'm becoming more loving, more courageous, the person that I ache and long to become like you. 
but it doesn't feel like any of that's happening. Most of the time, you know what it feels like? It feels like I'm laying in my bed. And then I start thinking about work. Then I go, oh, wait, God. And then, wait, I wonder if there's an NBA playoff game tonight. Wait, wait, God. And there's like this ping-ponging and pulling, and I always have to gently nudge my thoughts back to God, back to God. And when I first started doing this, I would do it in the morning, and that's it. I would forget to go back to God. But as I've been doing it, man, throughout the day, I'll just be driving my car. And before, my thoughts would go everywhere. In some places where I'm like, ooh, that wasn't good. I find myself, I'm driving down the road, and I'm like, God, I just want to be with you right now. Or I'm at work, and all of a sudden I realize, God, you're with me. And throughout the day, as this increases, I've also noticed I have more patience for my kids. I have more love for the people around me, especially my students, because, you know, middle schoolers are crazy. If the praise team could come up, I wanted to invite everyone here into a practice. And it's an ancient practice. People for thousands of years, followers of Jesus, have done this simple practice of abiding, which is to simply come into his presence and just be. I didn't realize how hard that was for me. And so for a minute, to just be with him, not doing anything, but just being with him. And notice, if you want to just start doing something, does it feel uncomfortable? Does it feel comfortable? Is there resistance? I'm inviting you. It's not a directive. You don't have to. But just for a minute, to just sit and be with God. And whenever your mind starts to wander, and it might, mind does all the time, just a gentle nudge. You don't need to drag your mind. Just say, back to God. I'm thinking about work. I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat afterwards. Back to God. So, Father, we just come to you right now. You said to your disciples that you're the true vine, the source of rest and life. And to make our home in you, and you would make our home in us. So, God, we just simply want to abide with you for the next 60 seconds. about halfway there, I want you to imagine that God is looking at you with a loving gaze, an accepting gaze. Back to God. Let God love you where you are. If there was resistance and you didn't want to do it, that's where God is loving you right now. That's where he's looking at you with a loving gaze in your resistance. If your mind was racing all over the place, things you got to do, or you just feel like your mind is just untethered, back to God. And he's looking at you with an unending love. If your mind went to wrongs that have been done to you, wherever your mind went, 
That's where God is loving you right now. If you felt nothing, that's where God is loving you right now. As the Father has loved me, I've also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. We're not meant to be sea turtles. We're created to be in loving relationship with God and to love one another. God, I thank you that as we, with unveiled faces, behold your glory and your beauty, we are being transformed, ever transformed into your increasing glory. God, I thank you that I'm becoming more like you, that you are shaping us and molding us as your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.